and then also from USA Today uh, is this. Though the idea of placing women in combat roles has been batted around for decades and successfully executed by some of the closest U.S. allies, few believe this tech tectonic... Watch all of this in our video library at cspan.org. U.S. House gaveling back in for a series of votes. Following order. Ordering the previous question on House Resolution 122, adopting House Resolution 122 if ordered, and agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. The first electronic vote will be conducted as a 15-minute vote. Remaining electronic votes will be conducted as five-minute votes. The unfinished business is on the vote on ordering the previous question on House Resolution 122 on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Calendar Number 12, House Resolution 122, Resolution providing for consideration of the concurrent resolution, House Concurrent Resolution 25, establishing the budget for the United States government for fiscal year 2014 and setting forth appropriate budgetary levels for fiscal years 2015 through 2023, providing for consideration of the resolution, House Resolution 115, providing for the expenses of certain committees of the House of Representatives in the 113th Congress and for other purposes. The question is on ordering the previous question. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This will be a 15-minute vote. Earlier this afternoon, the House began work on the rules for debate for the fiscal year 2014 budget resolution and five substitutes. The rule provides for four hours of general debate. This is the previous question vote. It is a 15-minute vote. The rule vote will follow. And for a preview of the 2014 budgets that passed out of both the House and Senate budget committees, we spoke to a Capitol Hill reporter. Paul Krawczak writes for CQ Roll Call. Paul, what are you expecting to hear in the debate when House Budget Committee Chair Paul Ryan's budget plan comes up this week? Uh, I'm expecting to uh, hear a very spirited debate. Um, in both um, in the Senate and in the House, you will have uh, Republicans and Democrats um, on uh, very, uh, very different, uh, different sides of uh, what should be done. Paul Ryan's budget, how does it compare to the Democrats' proposal? Um, it cuts spending a lot more, and it uh, reduces the deficit a lot more. Uh, Ryan's budget would uh, reduce the deficit almost $6 trillion um, in 10 years. Um, the Murray budget uh, would reduce it a little under two, a little under $2 trillion in 10 years. So uh, what other groups are planning to offer their own budget plans, uh, and what are those plans likely to focus on? Well, uh, in the House, uh, Chris Van Hollen, who is the top Democrat on the House Budget Committee, will introduce a Democratic alternative, and actually it will be similar to Patty Murray's Democratic budget in the Senate. Uh, both of those plans uh, will uh, have tax increases as well as some spending cuts, and uh, neither of them would balance the budget in 10 years. They're less aggressive as far as deficit reduction. Um, in the House, also, the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional uh, Progressive Caucus will be introducing budgets, um, and it's possible that a, that a version of the Ryan budget could be introduced in the Senate. The Senate is expected to work on its own budget. What is likely to happen in the Senate this week? Well, it, it'll, be, um, it, it'll be Democrats making the case uh, for the Patty Murray budget, and they may have to uh, convince, try to conv there could be some Democratic senators who might not support that budget, so they will have to sell it to Democratic senators as well as, as, well as Republicans, but no Republicans are likely to vote for the budget. Uh, the Republicans will be calling for, uh, for more spending cuts, no tax increase, balancing the budget sooner, that kind of thing. Republicans say that the, this will be the first time in four years that Senate Democrats have agreed to put forward a plan. Why is this year different? Well, um, the, uh, there are a number of different things. Um, one is there, there's a law that was passed uh, that, that says that uh, the members of Congress will not get paid um, unless they have a budget resolution. Um, another thing is the last two years, uh, the, the debt limit law uh, basically established 
discretionary spending amounts, so you technically did not need a budget uh, the last couple years. Uh, but also, uh, Democrats in the Senate have just been getting hammered for the past several years for not introducing a budget resolution, and uh, they finally decided uh, that uh, uh, you know it's in their interests to uh, have a plan out this year. So, w with all this work on these various budget proposals, what's the end game? Um, it, what what is next? Well, there will probably be some attempt to get a compromise between the House and the Senate budget resolutions. Uh, very unlikely that they will be able to compromise because they're so far apart. Um, but there are some commonalities in these budgets, even though there are uh, great differences between them. And so these two plans could be the beginning of, of a bigger agreement over the next several months. Uh, the debt ceiling will have to be raised sometime this summer, and uh, these these plans could become part of a larger plan to raise the debt ceiling. Paul Krawczak writes for CQ Roll Call. Thanks for talking with us today. Thank you. The Senate today continues work on the, the House passed continuing resolution funding the federal government through the end of uh, fiscal year 2013. The current funding runs out. March 27th. Followed the Senate on C-SPAN 2. Here in the House, it's the first of three votes. Previous question vote ahead of the vote on the rule for the um, the 2014 budget resolution, a Republican bill which would provide the rule would provide for four hours of general debate and consideration of five alternatives. If the rule passes, they will have the uh, general debate today and save the uh, five alternatives, the substitutes, most likely for uh, tomorrow. So 15-minute vote underway on the House. We expect the uh, uh, the rule vote to be a five-minute vote. Earl Blumenauer of Oregon is a member of not only the Ways and Means Committee, but of the House Budget Committee. He was our guest this morning on Washington Journal to talk about the 2014 budget. And we're back with Congressman Earl Blumenauer, Democrat of Oregon, sits on the Ways and Means and Budget Committee uh, committees here to talk about tax policy and budget battles. Here's the headline from the Hill newspaper uh, yesterday: House Democrats unveil their own budget, 1.2 trillion in taxes, 200 billion uh, in new stimulus. I want to read an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal this morning uh, by two economists who say how the House Republican budget would boost the economy because it slows spending, the opposite of what Republicans are trying to do. According to our research, the spending restraint and balanced budget parts of the House Budget Committee plan would boost the economy immediately. With the Budget Committee's proposed tax reform included, the immediate impact would be even larger. The entire plan would raise gross domestic product by one percentage point in 2014, equivalent to about a 1,500 increase for each U.S. household. Ten years from now, at the end of the official budget horizon, we estimate that the entire plan would raise GDP by three percentage points, or more than 4,000 for each U.S. household, because you are keeping the money in the private sector. Congressman? Well, first of all, the budget itself uh, is, as I said on the floor of the House yesterday, it's fantasy land. It's predicated on repealing Obamacare, which you may recall we had an election. Uh, this was the main uh, uh, argument against the president by Romney and Ryan. The voters decided. They reelected the president. They elected more Democrats to the Senate. And Democrats in the House got a million more votes than Republicans. Uh, the Republican budget uh, has the same uh, approach to taxation. They're going to lower taxes uh, dramatically to a 25% top rate. And magically, they're going to be able to do this and be budget neutral. But you remember, for six months in the campaign trail, the Republicans could never explain how you could do that without dramatically increasing taxes on the middle class. And the reason they couldn't is because you can't do that unless you're going to raise taxes on the middle class. They're going to increase defense spending when everybody recognizes that we're going to have to scale down and reposition the defense budget. Um, it's a hopeless mishmash that will never happen. And if it did, it would not uh, in stimulate the economy. Look what's happening in Great Britain where they're on the austerity kick. How's that worked out? We've had far greater economic growth than the Brits. Um, so 
quote all you want from the Wall Street Journal, kind of the house organ of the Republican uh, Party, uh, but uh, it's just a hopelessly unrealistic budget, and what they're talking about not only isn't going to happen, it shouldn't. It's the beginning of the process. The bill comes to the floor <laughs> uh, this yeah. week for, for votes in the House. Um, and the Senate has, the Senate Democrats have their own budget. President Obama hoping the two sides come together for some sort of grand bargain. Here's the headline from the President coming up to Capitol Hill last week to meet with House Democrats like yourself telling them that it's better to make changes to entitlement programs when a Democrat is in office rather than risk doing so under a Republican chief executive. Your response to that? Well, I have felt all along that it was possible for us to be able to change how we do business. That's one of the reasons why I voted against uh, the New Year's Eve deal, because it wasn't enough. Uh, it wasn't bold. It didn't change anything. And it created three fiscal cliffs for a modest amount of revenue recapture. Um, uh, I'm open to our being able to make changes. In fact, uh, if we accelerate the health care reform that has already been improved, rather than pretend like we're going to abolish it, there are opportunities for us to dramatically reduce Medicare expenditures in the out years. I come from a state that is now working to accelerate that reform. The federal government has bet $1.9 billion that we can meet our promise of reducing the rate of increase 2% a year and maintain the quality standards. Uh, these are things we should be working on uh, rather than uh, fairyland budgeting and talking past each other. Let's see if we can actually make the changes rather than throwing rocks at each other. From the Hill newspaper about the House Democrats' budget proposal, raises $1.2 trillion in revenue over 10 years by ending corporate individual tax breaks, $200 billion in stimulus spending, turns off nine years of sequestration cuts, it reduces deficits over 10 years by $1.8 trillion. What, does, what do the House Democrats say on changing Medicare uh, and or Social Security? Well, first of all, Social Security doesn't affect the deficit. By law, Social Security is self-contained. And we have 25 years where we've got to make some changes. And I agree that we should. But trying to mix this up in the budget discussion is irrelevant. Uh, that's not going to deal with balancing the, uh, our challenges for a sustainable fiscal future uh, with the federal budget over the next couple years. Although, uh, I'd be happy to see us spend time working with the American public to deal with what they'd like to do to bring it into balance over the long term. And I just finished mentioning that being able to accelerate the reforms that are in the Affordable Care Act is the quickest way to bring down Medicare spending, not shoving the responsibility off on the disabled and the elderly with a voucher. That's a prescription for disaster. The American public rejected it last November, and they should have. There are better ways to deal with that problem. What about a changed CPI, a change to the formula for calculating cost of living adjustments? Um, what about that idea? Well, as I said, first, uh, the, the Social Security should be separated out. But uh, I personally uh, have no problem with our going in and adjusting, for example, some of the Medicare in the out years for wealthier recipients to maybe not get quite as much uh, a rate of in have a little more that they pay. Um, but uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, the point that the president made when he talked to us that has lost on some commentators is that a, a chained CPI without dealing with the compounding effects for uh, seniors who live to be 85, 90 can see a dramatic reduction in their benefits and older people actually in some cases have more expenses uh, rather than younger people in terms of what they pay for health care, for instance. What was the reaction in the room when the president said, look, it's better to change these programs now under a Democratic president well, than wait well, for Well, bear in mind it was in the context of a broader conversation. And the president is saying he wants us to move forward. 
Um, he acknowledged that there were problems, for example, if you didn't deal with low and moderate income people and that, th that this could pose some problems. So it was a nuanced statement that he said and he was saying you ought to be willing to look at it. It wasn't that he was committing to a specific and he acknowledged the concerns that some of my colleagues have, concerns that I share. We'll go to Mickey in Berna, Kentucky. First call here, Democratic caller. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I wanted to ask the representative why the, the, uh, the representatives, Democratic representatives, aren't asking the Republicans, because the Republicans always spout off that we, uh, we have to balance the budget, we have to do it without any reforms. They say that the American people don't have any, they know they have to run a household with a balanced budget, but see, that's not true. Because we don't run a balanced budget at homes. We have house payments. We have car payments and stuff like that. And I'd just like to know why they don't remind the Republicans that, hey, people don't have a, a balanced budget at home. Well, your, your caller's making an important point. Uh, most of us have uh, a, a home mortgage. Many of us have credit card debt or student loans uh, that we make investments that we think will pay off over time. Uh, also, the federal government is different from a household. When a household income shrinks, we make adjustments uh, justifiably. But sometimes when the federal government's budget shrinks, it's exactly the time that the federal government needs to be spending more, for example, on unemployment and food stamps. Uh, the federal government has a responsibility for dealing with people in tough times. If we had cut back on unemployment, cut back on food stamps, when the bottom fell out of the economy, we still would be falling. That's what they did in Great Britain to ill effect. Um, so we don't want to confuse uh, the principles. We want the federal government to be sustainable over time. We're obviously going to pay our bills, which some of my Republican friends sometimes threaten that we won't uh, for past spending. Uh, but there is a big difference between a household and the federal government's responsibility in tough times. Pat, Long, South Carolina, Republican. Yes, good morning. Hi, Pat. Morning. Good morning. I wanted to ask um, the senator or Congress, I'm sorry. I could, anyway, you keep saying that the Democrats are out to protect the middle class. I've heard that so much, I'm sick of it. When Obamacare comes in effect, we're going to be taxed on medical equipment. Anything we get is going to be a tax. There's more taxes in Obamacare, and y'all are hiding it. Explain that one. Thank you. Well, actually, the, the recommendation that was made and enacted into law was that there were revenue increases. It wasn't hidden. They were talked about in the newspapers. They were debated on the floor. They're talked about now. You're not going to get something for nothing. But for the, for the vast majority of people, uh, the benefits of having uh, approximately 30 million more people getting health care and the subsidies that are available for lower and middle income uh, taxpayers to even it out and the benefits of not having lifetime limits on health insurance, for instance, or being denied insurance because of pre-existing conditions. And that's a very cruel tax on the American public. And the stories uh, that we've heard about people who simply can't get health care or who half uh, the bankruptcies are from medical costs, something that doesn't happen any place else in the world, um, the balance, I think, makes sense. And it's one that I voted for. I thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think the American public, on balance, are going to be getting a very good deal. Terry in Tacoma, Washington, independent caller. Oh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, Terry. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, I just want to say uh, uh, to all Americans out there, you know, we have to uh, stop being Democrats and Republicans. We're all in this thing together. You know, we're all going down the tube together. Uh, but I wanted to uh, straighten out the senator there. Earlier he said, I'm so tired of the Democrats, you know, saying, well, we got elected. You know, a million people elected us in, in the office. Uh, you know, that's 
we're doing what the public wants or the people want. Well, when he was when Mr. Obama was running for office, uh, he he promised there wouldn't be any taxes raised on anyone uh, below two hundred fifty thousand dollars. He promised there wouldn't be a sequester. Uh, he promised that he would immediately sign through the Canadian, uh, the Canadian oil pipeline. He's done none of those. Uh, so I think to say that. You know, we voted him in because we liked him. We might like what he was promising, but it all became hollow promises. All right. Uh, well, Congressman Actually, your caller is mistaken. Uh, I am aware of nothing on the campaign trail where the president said he was going to immediately sign into law the Keystone Pipeline. He was talking about uh, studying it, making uh, a, a decision in a timely fashion, but I don't think that was a commitment. The president actually has been rather uh, aggressive in making sure that he didn't increase taxes under, on people who made under $250,000. He didn't say he wouldn't raise taxes on people who made over that. Uh, although, ironically, uh, the taxes were set to expire under the Bush tax cuts. So those, those were scheduled to go away. That's what the Republicans passed uh, 12 years ago. Um, the only tax that increased was a temporary tax that was uh, relief that was given to reduce the payroll tax to try and give a shot in the arm to the economy. That was always designed to be a temporary tax. Um, and uh, as a practical matter, the president has in fact kept his pledge. It's ironic, uh, polls show that the majority of people thought with the uh, Economic Recovery Act that their taxes increased when in fact 94% of the people saw a reduction. What the president promised, he did, uh, but a lot of people didn't understand it, thought their taxes increased. But people who go back and actually look at the facts understand they've received tax reductions. I personally think that we've gone a little bit overboard. Um, we're going to have to rebalance the scales. But the president uh, kept his promises on taxation, um, and uh, notwithstanding what your uh, caller said, your caller's wrong. The Sandy, uh, Sandy Beach on Twitter says, the private sector will always be a better fiscal bet than anything run by the government. Fact, says this person. Uh, we're talking about the budget with our guest Earl Blumenauer as the House today begins work this week on the uh, budget put out by Paul Ryan last week. The Hill newspaper reporting this this morning, leaders stop budget defections. Uh, they're reporting this morning, Eric Wasson, that uh, the Republicans in the House have enough votes from their own uh, to pass this, and Senate Democrats also have enough votes uh, of their own to pass their budget over in that chamber. We'll go to Barb in Fort Myers, Florida, or excuse me, Sean, uh, in uh, Portland, Connecticut, independent caller. Hi, Sean. Portland, Connecticut. Hey, is that I, right? Sean, yes, is that right? right? Portland, Connecticut? Wow. Yes, Portland, okay. Connecticut. All yes, right. not Portland, Maine. <laughs> or Oregon, right? But um, yeah, my question is this. I, I, this: everything seems to me as an independent boils. It, everything boils down to money. You got the Republicans who seem to cater to upper middle class and wealthy people, and Democrats um, cater to lower middle class and poorer people. And as long as there's that division, it's always going to be a fight over money. We have a hundred-year-old tax code. How come you guys never seriously talk about changing the tax code so everybody pays and it's fair to everyone, and then you're not fighting over tax increases? That's, that's what I wanted to ask. All right, Sean. Uh, well, your caller makes uh, an important point about tax reform. And this is actually, I think, one thing that Republicans and Democrats do agree on. The tax code has grown into an unwieldy monster. It costs us over $160 billion a year just to comply with it. We give away more money in tax breaks than it actually collects in net revenue to the federal government. And it's hopelessly unfair along with being complex. I do think there are opportunities for us to have some bipartisan support to make some changes. Uh, I'm working uh, in the, on the Ways and Means Committee as part of some uh, working groups where people in, on both the Republican and Democratic side are meeting in informal groups. We had a fascinating hour and a half conversation yesterday. 
dealing with ways to make the corporate tax work better. We have the highest statutory corporate tax rate in the world now, but almost nobody pays it. The average tax rate is uh, about 25%, and then there are some corporations, famously, that pay little or no corporate tax. I think there are opportunities for us to eliminate some of the corporate tax deductions, loopholes, if you will, be able to lower the tax, make it work better. Um, there's an area, I think, of some bipartisan cooperation. But one of the things we have to do with the individual tax, um, individual tax, is to try and see if people can zero in on what it is they want the tax code to do. And I think that's a conversation that has been uh, long on hyperbole uh, and short on sort of shirt sleeve, roll them up and try and figure out what it is that we want. Earl Blumenauer serves on the Tax Policy Committee called the Ways and Means Committee in the House as well as the Budget Committee. Here's a budget question for you from Joy Mean on Twitter. What is the highest level of debt that we can afford in your opinion? Well, the, what we need to do is to stabilize and reduce the debt burden. We're looking at 70% uh, of uh, the uh, GDP. Um, I'm, I'm guessing um, that one of the things that people need to focus on is what's happening with the economy. If the economy is growing, if people are working, if we have positives going forward, that we can gradually uh, reduce this, stabilize it over time. We've had these peaks and valleys in the past, and Americans have responded. Uh, part of it is investing in making sure that we renew and rebuild the country. We did that after World War II. We spent money so that returning veterans could go to college and buy a home. We spent money on the interstate highway system. Uh, we made investments that helped make our country stronger. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers just came out with a report that shows we're 3.6 billion, a trillion dollars short between now and 2020 of the needs for our infrastructure. Uh, right now, people from around the world are giving the federal government money, um, essentially uh, paying us to keep their money because we're the safest place in the world for uh, those investments. We ought to be able to take low interest rates, invest in rebuilding and renewing the country, improvements that'll last for 50 years. We shouldn't be borrowing for current government operations, so we need to bend that curve. Um, I, I think that if the economy grows, we reform the tax code, that we, we are going to be able to bring it back down from the current levels. But remember, the world, the, some of the smartest people in the world with billions of dollars, have judged that we are sort of an island of stability in an uncertain world. So it's not quite like we're on the verge, verge of becoming Greece. Jim, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Republican. Good Hi, morning. How are you? Hi. Go ahead. You're on the air. Okay. I have a question for Mr. Blumenauer. He, he made the statement that the Democrats won the election, but he didn't uh, tell about the all the voter fraud that they made him win the election, like all the voter fraud in the battleground states. And these people in Ohio right now that are going to jail. And Jim, where did you where did you where did you read about the the Pardon? fraud? Where'd you read about it? Read about it. It's all, it was all over the news. Okay. You you didn't know, really say much about it. Eighty nine. The previous question is ordered. Question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, on that I request the yeas and nays. The lady from New York requests the yeas yeah. and nays. Those in support of the request will rise. Sufficient number having arisen or yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a five-minute vote.
The House moves on to the vote on the rules for debate for the fiscal year 2014 budget resolution. The rule would provide for four hours of general debate and the consideration of five alternatives, including an alternative from the Progressive Caucus and the Republican Study Committee. We expect the House, if they pass the rule, to do that general debate this evening and reserve the five substitutes for uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. Five-minute vote on the House floor. Also ahead, a bill that would um, set committee funding levels for uh, 2013.
this vote, the yeas are 224, the noes are 189. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the question of agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal on which the yeas and nays were ordered. The question is on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote.
this vote, the yeas are 272, the nays are 133, with one voting present. The journal stands approved. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Michigan rise? Speaker, on the direction of the Committee on House Administration, I sent to the desk a privileged report for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 127, resolution dismissing the election contest relating to the Office of Representative from the 28th Congressional District of Texas. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. The House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? House res, uh, Resolution 127. I would ask for unanimous consent for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the resolution. House calendar number 13, House Resolution 127. Resolved that the election contest relating to the Office of Representative from the 28th Congressional District of Texas is dismissed. Without objection, the resolution is agreed to. And the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks on the resolution. Without objection, so ordered. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Michigan seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the rule, I call up House Resolution 115 and I would ask for its immediate consideration in the House. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Calendar Number 11, House Resolution 115, resolution providing for the expenses of certain committees of the House of Representatives in the 113th Congress. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Miller, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, will each control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Michigan. Mr. Speaker, again, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Uh, without objection, so ordered. The Thank gentlelady you. will suspend. The chair would ask all members and staff to please take their conversations from the floor. The chair would ask members on both sides of the aisle to please take their conversations from the floor, take their seats. Gentleman from, uh, the gentlewoman from Michigan will proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll yield myself as much time as I might consume. Gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in very strong support of House Resolution 115, which is providing for the expenses of certain committees of the House of Representatives for the 113th Congress, and which authorizes committee budgets for the 113th Congress. Earlier this month, Mr. Speaker, the Committee on House Administration held two very lengthy and very informative uh, days of hearings with our chairmen and with our ranking members from all of the 19 House committees. Uh, each of them testified about their respective budgets, the commitment to uphold the longstanding two-thirds, one-third allocation between majority and minority offices, and most importantly, Mr. Speaker, they talked about doing more with less, which is the topic that we are all very, very familiar with. This funding process, and these discussions significantly impact the legislative process, as these committees are aware, of course, the legislation that compromised much of our work begin, where our vital oversight functions occur, which is why, throughout this process, we adhered, Mr. Speaker, to very, two very important principles. First of all, we said, living within our means. We need to live within our means. And then prioritizing the finite resources that we have provided to us in the Congress by hardworking American taxpayers. As we all know, sequestration went into effect on March 1, 2013, and Congress must live with further cuts just as every other agency of government must live with similar cuts. As a result of the sequester, the total committee authorization level must be reduced by approximately 11 percent in the 11 percentile range. And that means if we authorize above that amount, then we will have to take the money from somewhere else. And when ensuring that committees have adequate resources, obviously we have to consider their legislative objections, or objectives. We have to consider their anticipated workload and authorize the finite resources available in, the, in a way that best suits the needs of the House of Representatives as a whole. And although the sequestration is not certainly the ideal way to cut spending, cuts are imperative. 
they must happen our government is too big too involved and too costly and as those who are charged with care of taxpayers dollars we need to lead by example and we must control our spending we must live within our own means now this may be a far more strict budget than many had hoped for or anticipated but like so many americans we are coping with our circumstances and we are making cuts to our budgets in a way that any american business or american family would have to and as every local unit of government every state around the country has had to do certainly doing during these very trying economic times we also have to make value judgments and budget accordingly and to match the available post sequestration funding level the total of authorization amount for house committees must be reduced as i say by about 11 percent from the uh, 2012 level and therefore with very few exceptions each committee authorization has been reduced again within that 11 percent range or certainly within a percentage point or so of the 11 percent based on the anticipated workload for the 113th congress the budget committee the committee on ways and means and the select committee on intel have been given uh, very uh, much smaller reductions a very uh, slight reduction from the 11 percent but every committee certainly will be faced with important oversight responsibilities for 2013 however given that getting our economy moving again and defending this nation are the foremost priorities that we face the dire need for tax and entitlement reform to help grow our economy to create good paying private sector jobs and the increasing cyber threats to our digital infrastructure it was uh, determined by our committee that these three committees certainly are the tip of the spear in doing some of the most important work for the american people we must remain as well committed to leading by example in cutting government waste rooting out inefficiencies and conducting essential and efficient oversight of our vast administrative agencies house resolution 115 mr speaker we believe fulfills that mission and i would also point out that this house resolution not only reduces committee expenditures but it also authorizes total committee uh, committee funding for the 113th congress at a level which is lower than 2005 and i think that bears repeating a level lower than 2005. By comparison, overall non-defense discretionary spending by the executive branch has actually increased 16.7 percent since 2008. Quite a big difference there. And as I've said before as chairman of the Committee on House Administration, I certainly understand the challenges of stretching committee resources, and I have a very deep appreciation for every committee's ability to absorb these cuts and their commitment to functioning at a high level <clears throat> even with the reduced resources that they have and that is due certainly in no small measure to the outstanding leadership that we have with each committee chairman and each ranking member on all of our committees really all committed to delivering a very high level of service to the american people and some of my colleagues i know have voiced their opposition to this measure calling for a freeze in committee spending they say that freezing spending for committees at 2012 levels is a more balanced approach. But since sequestration, we just don't have the money to cover a freeze. We do not have the money. So I would simply state that spending beyond our means, in my opinion, is not a balanced approach. In fact, I would say it's a bit irresponsible. And as I've said before, every American family, every small business, every state and local unit of government, must live within their means and so must the u.s house of representatives mr speaker again this resolution has required us to make some very difficult but very necessary decisions and i want to personally thank and certainly all of our committee members thank each chairman and each ranking member who testified before our committee and our committee staffs as well who are often unrecognized uh, for the vital work that they do I would urge, Mr. Speaker, all of my colleagues to support House Resolution 115, living within our means and prioritizing our finite resources like the rest of America. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady reserves the balance of her time. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to House Resolution 115 and yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized for such time as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, House Resolution 115 represents the next step in a slow march towards making House committees incapable of conducting the oversight with which they are charged and further li limiting the power of this equal branch of government. 
Mr. Speaker, with these cuts, we're not talking about the loss of new equipment or the next computer or the printer, no. With these cuts, we are talking about gutting our capacity to do the jobs we were sent here to do by the American people. The work product, our committees, is only as good as the talented men and women that we are ably employing, and they are very able. The House is lucky to have such a well-seasoned and skilled group of individuals carrying out the people's business. In fact, this is one of the things we always agree on, the quality of the people that work in these committees. It's at the highest level. But for how long? If this resolution passes, there will be a 21.3 percent reduction in funding from committees since the 111th Congress. More appalling is the 26 percent cut the Judiciary Committee will sustain during the same time, particularly as we look forward to addressing the comprehensive immigration reform that we all seem to agree on now and the initiatives to reduce gun violence. As the Chairman of the Rules Committee stated last week when he testified before our committee, he stated, we do not have something we can cut or manage on a moving forward basis. We have, by and large, taken ourselves down to the bare bones. Now we're down to the bare bones. Repeatedly, we heard from committee chairs that the only thing they have let, left to cut are personnel expenses. The Veterans Affairs Chairman stated, and quote, we have no choice but to find these savings in our personnel budget, end of quote. And the Chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs said, we want to make certain that those individuals who make a sacrifice and come up here and work for a reduced wage will stay with us. There is a question of how long and deeply we can cut. Of course there's a question. I think the question is before us. The chairs and ranking members of the House have been responsible stewards. We heard that already, and they have been. And they've achieved incredible savings, but this resolution's lack of funding also hurts our ability to find government-wide cost savings. In fact, it does just the opposite. The committee's conduct conduct oversight over billions and billions of dollars of federal spending and have found savings within their respective agencies. However, without high-quality people that have the institutional knowledge and expertise, they will sacrifice the ability to form strong, responsible oversight. The chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee illustrated this best when testifying before the, the savings his auditors were able to provide the government. He stated, cutting back for us, in fact, an opportunity to lose the very auditors that will guarantee you multiple savings. We would like to work with the committee to allow us and other committees to find similar savings. But we must ask that you not allow the audit committee to be reduced when, in fact, we can return you more than a thousand times our budget, a thousand times. In Mark, it's only a hundred times, fourfold in other parts of the Bible. Here's a thousand times. Mr. Speaker, members on both sides of the aisle have embraced the idea of doing more with less. We've all grappled with the idea of not filling empty positions, denying requests for travel and foregoing necessary technology upgrades in our offices. But there is a point where additional cuts undermine the ability to do our job effectively. Based upon the testimony that we received during the committee funding hearings, I believe that there is a bipartisan agreement that this funding resolution could represent that breaking point. In the end, the American people will be the ultimate victims. I urge my colleagues to defeat this resolution. I urge a no vote, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman, the gentleman lady from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, my pleasure at this time to yield uh, as much time as he may consume to uh, an outstanding member of the House Administration Committee, Mr. Rukita. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for such time as he may consume. I thank the Speaker, and I also thank the, the Chair for yielding uh, such time as I may consume. You know, I'm cons I rise in, rise in strong support of uh, House Resolution 115, but I appreciate, quite honestly, the concerns uh, just raised. And let me try to address uh, some of them, if not all of them. There are victims in this country, for sure. But the real victimization will occur if this House, if this Congress, if this President does not get a hold of the deficit and debt situation that we're incurring. Right now, we're in the middle of uh, debating different budgets, the priorities that we have as parties, as Americans, etc. On one hand, we have 
a budget that balances in 10 years. Radical for this town. On the other side, we have budgets that never, ever balance. And if we don't get a hold of these deficits, if we don't get a hold of these deficits so we can finally start attacking the debt, and if we continue to leave to future generations our bills, to me, Mr. Speaker, the most immoral thing I can think of, really, that we can do in civic life is to leave our bills for future generations to pay, there will be the victimization. Yes, we're going to have a hard time at the committee level and certainly even with our MRAs that have been cut in the, in the past to try to do our work. But what I heard in these committee hearings from our chairman and our ranking members each is that they pledged to continue their legislative and oversight activity to, activities despite these budget cuts. So there's not going to be any victimization here with this House resolution. The other thing this House resolution does is finally lets us lead by example, Mr. Speaker. How can we have a, a national family discussion? How can we have a discussion about the morality of leaving our bills for future generations to pay if we're not willing to suck some of it up ourselves? And yes, we're doing it. You know who else is doing it? The military. And I like to say here on the floor of the House that those excuses should now be taken off the table. We are leading by example in what we've cut through our MRAs already and this House resolution, and guess what? So has the military. Now let's finally get to a discussion and action, more importantly, regarding the real drivers of our debt, the social entitlement programs of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And yes, many of our constituents will say, hey, wait a minute, don't call those social entitlement programs. We paid into those. Therefore, we should get out. And that is true. But what is also true is that on average, let's take Medicare for example, Mr. Speaker, we're paying in about 40 percent, again, on average, of what we're taking out. Immoral, wrong to let that 60 percent go paid for by people who don't even yet exist and therefore don't have a say in the matter. House Resolution 115 lets us lead by example so that we can finally get to the rest of the conversation about the drivers of our debt. Guess what else? The interest we owe ourselves as private citizens and more increasingly, increasingly other countries like China, countries that don't necessarily have our best interests at heart, nor should they have to have our best interests at heart. We are paying more to them in interest because of this debt than we're spending on homeland security, education, roads combined. That breeds weakness. That fosters instability. That creates victimization. House Resolution 115 will give us the moral authority and the real authority to continue having this discussion, to lead by example, which is all so well needed in this country right now at this time. The fact of the matter is, we shouldn't have to oversight the budgets of the executive branch. If the executive branch and this president were to lead and recognize the debt that we're in, the deficits that we run, and rein in his own people, rein in his own organizations, create a culture of doing more with less. As, been, as it's been famously stated by a former governor in Indiana, people will never remember <laughs> or never miss the government that's been cut. <laughs> you know, it goes without saying, individualism, people can do more for themselves, people can do more for each other than any faraway federal government program can. Let's continue leading by example. Let's continue this fiscal fight that we're engaged in. Let's pass, let's strongly support House Resolution 115, and I yield back.